Hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's Word once again together. I want to look together at Psalm 117. Uh, Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm in the Psalter. It's only two verses. Uh, My dad always used to read a a psalm after the Sunday dinner. Sometimes he would ask us what psalm we wanted to read, and inevitably one of us kids would say Psalm 117, Um, and not for very pious reasons, just because it was the shortest psalm. Um, But I think as we consider this psalm and think about it together, we'll see uh, the vast importance of even this small psalm. And so we'll read it. It's just two verses, Psalm 117, and let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Um, as I said, this is the shortest psalm in the Psalter, but just because it's short doesn't mean it's not packed with important things to say to God's people and to the world. Uh, one commentator said, This tiny psalm is great in faith, and its reach is enormous. The shortest psalm proves, in fact, to be one of the most powerful and most important. Um, so hopefully that whets our appetite to see this psalm in its glory. And uh, it's fairly easy to describe in terms of its form. God's people are called to praise um, in verse 1. So there's a call to praise. And then there's a reason for praise uh, in verse 2. That's a really simple reason, simple layout of this psalm, a call to praise and the cause for praise. Um, We want to think about this psalm um, as it was used in the life of Israel. So we want to keep coming back to how these psalms functioned in the life of Israel. This is one of the psalms they would sing after the Passover meal. Um, They would sing routinely. Um, to remind themselves of the redemption in Egypt. And we also want to think about this in psalm in terms of the life of Jesus. Uh, as we think about these psalms and think about how they function in Israel at the end of Passover, we remind ourselves that these are the probably the last psalms that Jesus sang before he went out to be betrayed and arrested and ultimately crucified and killed. Um, and so these function in the life of Jesus as well. Um, and so in this short psalm, we really see this this, this call to praise and the cause God's people are to praise. And so those are the first two things I really want to think about uh, together, the content of the call to praise and then the cause for the call that the psalm calls our attention to. Um, it begins with a call to worship, and the call to worship is kind of unusual for who is being called to worship the Lord. Uh, notice how it's addressed to all nations and all peoples are called to extol God. Uh, Usually it's God's people who are being called to worship his name. Israel as a nation or the people of God, the people who are part of his covenant. But here, notice, it calls to everyone, all people, all nations. Uh, Really, in a sense, this is a call to the Gentiles, this call that goes out. Um, A diverse group of people are mentioned here in this call to praise. The nations is a way of referring to all of the national entities that are in the world. And then all the tribes or all the peoples is a way of identifying all those different ethnic identities. Israel was a people, but there were a lot of other peoples in the world, and all of those peoples are also being called to praise. So it's really a call that's being issued to all people from any ethnicity in all the world, not just Israel, to come and to praise the God. Wherever they are in the world, whoever they are in the world, they're called by this psalm. Um, That's a good reminder, right, that God's call in the world is a diverse call. Um, There's no nation in the world that can say we're not called by God. That's a call for other nations. There's no people in the world who can say that's a call for other people. That's not a call for us. Every man or woman under the sun is called to praise the Lord. It's for every image bearer everywhere. Um, This call goes out universally. But it raises an important question as this universal call, right? How can all nations and all peoples who are outside of the covenant uh, praise the covenant Lord of Israel? How can they do that? Right? There's a difference between enthusiastic praise as opposed to grudging or forced recognition. Right? If you watch, if you watch a, a Padres game as a Padre fan and they win, you celebrate it as a fan. If you talk to the manager of the opposing team after, they'll say, you know, they played a good game, they outplayed us, whatever. They always say the same thing. Right, Man, That's why sports interviews are not that interesting unless someone goes off script and then it's usually bad and really interesting. Um, but you always expect the other team, if you're, they're beaten, to say, yeah, you know, all credit to our opponent, they outplayed us, whatever. Um, but there's a difference, right, between that kind of grudging, forced recognition of what the other team did and the way a fan reacts. 
in, in a much more profound way. There's a bigger difference between how all the peoples and all the nations react to God as opposed to his own people and those people who love him and acknowledge his name. Right? We know at the end of history, the, the unfaithful will acknowledge the Lord, right? but not with praises and glory, but with agony. Right? That's the sad testimony of Revelation 1-7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes in the, of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So this psalm really begs the question, how do all the nations and all the peoples become enthusiastic worshipers of of the covenant Lord of Israel. And so we have to look at the cause for the call that's extended here in the psalm as well. Uh, Why are all peoples and nations called to praise and glorify the Lord? Verse 2, For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Right? Two simple but profound reasons given in this psalm. Uh, First, the Lord's prevailing love, and second, his perpetual faithfulness. That's why all people are called to praise his name. We're to praise his name for his prevailing love. Um, All peoples and all nations are witnesses to all the blessings that God has always showered on his own people, right? Particularly for that steadfast love that always prevails over them. Um, It's not just that his steadfast love is great in terms of being large or massive, right? Which is certainly true. The Lord's love is great in that sense of being large or massive, but that's not really the sense in which the psalmist is using the word great here. The sense of the word here really means that his steadfast love or his covenant loyalty always prevails in strength over his people. Um, Someone said of this word great, it's a vigorous, formidable word used of the stronger side in a battle. Right? Israel prevailed when Moses raised his hands in the battle described in Exodus 17, 11. It's, it's a reminder that whatever has befallen the people of the Lord, it's always his steadfast love that prevails in the end. His steadfast love is great over whatever God's people are facing. God's steadfast love has always been the salvation of his people, the fact that that love is great and prevails over whatever God's people have faced, no matter what difficulties they go through in this world, his steadfast love prevails over them, right? Thinking back to to Passover when God's people would sing this psalm, right? When they gathered together on the Passover and would sing this after the Passover meal, when they sang this psalm, their minds could have gone back to all that they suffered in slavery in Egypt. But at the end of the day, Pharaoh and all of his tyranny and all of his designs against the people of God, they had not prevailed, Right? What had prevailed? Not Pharaoh, not his tyranny. It's God's steadfast love that prevailed over his people. His steadfast love always prevails in the end, right? showing him to be who he revealed himself to be to Moses in Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. His love is so great, it always prevails over what faces God's people. It's always his steadfast love that swamps and washes over whatever God's people face to clear it out. His loyal covenant love will always prevail no matter what dangers God's people face. As it's reflected on in the Song of Solomon, love is strong as death. And even even the steadfast love of the Lord prevails over death. That's why God's people can be confident because of his prevailing love. And they're also caught the cause for praise is not just in his prevailing love, but in his perpetual faithfulness. Not only does God's love always prevail, his faithfulness endures forever. He's always true to do everything he's promised for his people. They will always find him true to his promises. God's love and faithfulness to his people means that whenever they sing this psalm, they can be sure that his past love will continue with them forever. Right? The history of God's people proves that his steadfast love always prevails. Right? Both the Bible and church history is full of examples of his love, his protection, his deliverance, his pardoning grace. No matter how far back we look, we see his steadfast love. And we can live in hope for the future because he will always be faithful to do what he's promised to do, just as he's done in the past. What God has been for us in the past, he is for us now and will be for us 
in the future. That's why we can have good hope for the future, that God's love and faithfulness will prevail over whatever befalls us in this life, because his faithfulness is forever. His faithfulness endures forever. And of course, the greatest example ever of God's abounding steadfast love prevailing over all other things and his enduring faithfulness towards us is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? God sends his son into the world as the ultimate demonstration and manifestation of his prevailing love. The love of God in Christ prevailed over all that faced God's people. It still does that because his faithfulness endures forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always been the demonstration of God's prevailing love and his perpetual faithfulness. He protects us from the devil. He delivers us from our sin and guilt. He showers upon us his pardoning grace, secured for us by dying on the cross and rising again for our justification. And he continues to, to apply his spirit to us that we might be united to him and encouraged by what he has said and is doing for his people. Uh, this is the story of God's people. This is why all people are called to praise his name, because his steadfast love prevails always for his people, and his faithfulness endures forever. Uh, what a wonderful, s- simple, but profound reminder for the people of God. Um, and what a wonderful thing that w- must have been for the Lord to think about as he went to his cross and to his death. Uh, We'll think about that, Lord willing, next time. Uh, But what a great reason we have to praise our God. Um, It's a simple but profound statement, isn't it? For great is his steadfast love toward us, and his faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this short but powerful psalm and how it uh, calls us to praise and gives us the reason that we should praise your name. We can be a forgetful people and forget just how much your your love has prevailed for your people uh, throughout our history and how also you have been eternally faithful and perpetually faithful to all you've promised to do. And may we think on all the ways you've shown that love and faithfulness to your people. Might that encourage us for whatever we're facing in the present and as we look to the future that we would face it with good hope, knowing that you are who you are and you will always be who you've always been for your people. Help us not to forget that, Lord. Help us uh, to be forgiven for the ways that we have failed to gratefully demonstrate how we are appreciative of that great love you've loved us with. Forgive us our sins. Uh, Fill us with, again, a knowledge of your love and your faithfulness that we might in gratitude serve you and continue to praise your name as the great God who has continued to prevail in love and show perpetual faithfulness to us. Forgive us our sins. Hear our prayers, for we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's good to be. It's been good to be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.